This is Reebok. It was always Reebok. When nobody knows you, it's tough. But it's when Jane Fonda, she bought a pair of shoes to wear in her uh, uh, videos, and it just exploded. We were then seen as a woman's company. Adidas, Nike. They were male. They were sweaty. We overtook Adidas. We overtook Nike. And we became number one. And that was fantastic. So in a period of four or five years, we'd gone from almost zero to a billion. Wikipedia comes along, Google comes along, and they're telling me, this is how Reebok started. So I wrote a book. And the book yep. was to put the story straight and to be my story. Reebok, today I interviewed the co-founder, Joseph William Foster. Yes, we spoke about business. Yes, we spoke about trainers. We spoke about money. And also his new venture, which is promoting his book, Shoemaker. He's on a mission. Tune into this podcast because I know you're going to find it very fun and entertaining. Be happy and never content. Okay, so I've got my next podcast guest in front of me. Uh, being a business person myself, there's a lot of things that um, business people have got to learn in life and also in business. And I think I've got one of the most influential, positive, inspiring uh, founders of a, of a business brand in front of me right now. Uh, Joseph William Foster, thank you very much for your time and thank you for agreeing to come to the podcast. Stephen, thank you for the invitation. Yes, it should be interesting. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, um, I've got down here that you're 87 years of age, is that correct? And that's just about right, yes. I don't talk about it too much, but <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Unfortunately, those years just keep on going by, don't they? And uh, yeah, all of a sudden you find yourself, well, I found myself at 87. Correct. <laughs> so being 87 advice that you would give me i'm 36 years of age and what do i not know as of yet about life itself and let's say business well i wouldn't know because i don't know your life yeah you know, it all, de all depends on what you're doing in your life and how you enjoy i think the one thing that i can say is are you enjoying it I am. Um, I am. There's obviously challenges and there's, there's, there's certain pitfalls, but overall, I'm happy. Overall, you're happy. Well, I mean, that's it. Providing you're an optimist and you've got a good, uh, a good feel for life and you want fun. You know, the important thing in whatever you're doing is to have fun with it. So, you know, if you're having fun, you're enjoying life, yeah, there'll be problems. In fact, the problems, if you don't get problems, then you're doing something wrong. Absolutely. You know, it's... Uh, they, you know, you, you've really got to expect problems because they, they are the challenges. You know, <clears throat> they're the things, they're the questions you need to say, well, okay, if I've got to pivot, if I've got to move, if I've got to do something different, let me do something different. So you start, you know, we, we did that with, with Reebok when we had our problems. It's like, at first you look at it and you think, oh, my God, what's happening? You know, I'm 23 years old, what can go wrong? I've just been business. Oh, then you find out. I can go wrong but you know those those are the challenges and that's good yeah yeah for sure so um i want to just sort of ask you quite a, a direct and bold maybe even personal question but part of the reason why i'm asking it from a from a bit of a selfish point of view is when i see people's accolades when i've seen what they've done taken from a very humble brand into a global phenomenal enterprise and then also amassed you know lots of assets and, and a fortune that inspires me, but the only way it's going to inspire me is if I actually ask the direct question. So when I was looking online, okay. the only publication I could come across is, I think it was published quite recently or certainly last year or so, from um, People AI. It said that you had a net worth of $204 million. What is your net worth, Joe? Well, that's, that's something I keep to myself. I mean, uh, Joe Foster, <laughs> as Julie just said, that's a different Joe Foster. <laughs> All right, fair, fair enough. Okay. So, um, uh, okay, is it is it fair to say it's in the hundreds of millions or is it in the billions? Well, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, it depends where, where, where you start counting and where you finish counting. So, you know, I, that's one of the, the points that I don't really discuss, you know, how much you're worth. Um, okay. it, it really doesn't, uh, you know, if, if people are just thinking of money, then that's probably the wrong thing to think about when, when you're, uh, if you're enjoying yourself and you've got a brand and you're doing something with it, um, it's not looking at the money, it's looking at the brand. It's like, you know, when did you find, when did you know about Joe Foster? 
I mean, I, I mean, I've I've known of you over the years. I knew Reebok before I knew Joe Foster, though. Yes. Well, Reebok. I mean, that was it for me. <clears throat> I didn't want to confuse everybody and say, you know, I'm Joe Foster and I'm Reebok. No, this is Reebok. It was always Reebok. And the only reason now that we're selling Joe Foster is because I wrote a book. Yeah. And the reason I wrote the book is because having retired nicely into Tenerife and sitting back in the sun, um, Wikipedia comes along, Google comes along, and they're telling me, this is how Reebok started. This is, an, and this is a photograph of Joe Foster. And no, the photograph, no idea who it was. The, uh, and, and the different ways that they said Reebok started, no. So I wrote a book. And the book yeah. was to put the story straight and to be my story. So, and, and it was really about Reebok, but it's, I'm now selling Joe Foster because I wrote a book and I want it to be. You know, the challenge at Reebok ended for me when we became number one. We, when you're number one, we, we overtook Adidas, we overtook Nike, <clears throat> and we became number one. And that was fantastic. We'd done yeah. it. Great. But by that time, we'd become corporate. And when you become corporate, um, all the uh, challenges have gone because everybody's doing the job. You've got loads of accountants. You've got a lot of uh, legal and a lot of people in between who are making shoes, designing shoes, marketing shoes. So I, I, and I was then waving a flag. I'm traveling around the world waving a flag. Okay, I'm doing some very nice things and we're putting on a <clears throat> pro celebrity tennis tournament in Monte Carlo. We're doing lots of good things, brilliant. But it was time for me to back off totally. I mean, I'd backed off before that uh, quite a bit because in a business, you, you're only as good as that period that you're in, not just enjoying it, but you're useful to it. And then it's time to say, look, a lot of people came into Reebok, a lot of good people. And that, that's what makes Reebok, or what made Reebok grow. So for me, it was, I, I, I got out of the business. And, uh, but now the challenge is, okay, I wrote a book. So there's a new challenge. Let's get this book to a bestseller in America. And that's, that's what we're doing right now. And that's, what, that's why we're doing this. Otherwise, I'd still be in Tenerife, still uh, drinking the sangria and enjoying the sunshine. But right now, we're traveling again. Yeah, I admire your, uh, your perseverance and uh, looking to challenge yourself all the time because so many people, I would imagine, if they had a very, very successful brand like, like you had or still is today, you know, it's quite easy to put up your feet, but it's the, the, the people I really admire that find the other thing that's going to get them out of bed in the, in the morning, which is your book, which is Shoemaker, correct? And now correct. you're pushing it and doing everything you can to make it a global success. So hats off to you, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we, we've got it in oh, probably about half a dozen languages now. And um, we, we have Mandarin and Cantonese and Spanish, fr French, and, uh, oh, I think Bulgarian as well. We've got lots, <laughs> we've got lots of language. So it's fun. It is, really is fun traveling around. And the problem with the book is that I just wrote it to tell people this is what we did. And now yeah. a lot of people are picking it up and saying, put their messages in there. You know, this, this is, and they're saying, you did that. So it's, it's become a bit of a business book now where people are seeing, uh, you know, what we did as a small company and uh, the challenges we had and more or less how we accepted challenges as uh, a way of growing your business because it, uh, you know, that, that growth was very slow to begin with. But we're going back to 1958. Yeah. Know? Money wasn't as available then as it is now. Yeah. Um, uh, now it's, there's so many different things. Uh, Julie and I with uh, a young guy, uh, this morning, fantastic young guy, and he's doing these boxes of, um, we'll say, end of lines. We need to collect them together, and he's putting them in boxes, and he's doing so good, and he's enthusiastic, and that's so important. You've got to be enthusiastic about whatever you do. So, yeah, and he's looking now to 
talk to people to get some back in. So, yeah, and that that's come about through writing the book. Yeah, so, good stuff. Yeah, good. yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. I'm going to just round off the part I said to you about net worth, and I totally agree with you. It's it really isn't important, and I think like it's like this podcast, right? If right. you have millions and millions of subscribers, but you wasn't impacting anybody, well, who cares about the million subscribers? You've got to be impacting people. When Reebok definitely impacted a lot of people around the world. The only way reason why I raise it is number one, I said to you, well, I get motivated thinking that you you, you came from let's say more of a sort of a humble background to where you are right now. And if someone like yourself can have an idea, work super, super, super hard, get over loads of challenges, pivot, dovetail, et cetera, and then the massive fortune, it gives you a bit of a target as a young entrepreneur to look at and think, right, if he's done it, I can go ahead with it. But I understand as well at the same time, being private is also, um, you know, one of the benefits in life. So let me get on to, you know, the, the, the value of the, the, the Reebok brand in a, in a moment. Before I do that, I want to ask you something which I find really interesting, which I actually still wish they had today in, in the modern world, certainly mm-hmm. in the UK. I see that, you know, you, you set up the brand with your brother, Jeffrey. Right. Um, so 1958, it was called a different uh, brand. It was Mercury Sports Footwear, if I'm, if I'm correct. That's right. And you got that right. Wasn't, wasn't there a period in time after about a year or so? I don't know whether it was this first brand or, or it was your, 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 your family's company where you had to step away and do national service. Is that right? Yeah. Well, the, uh, the family company started by my grandfather. Yeah. And, uh, and he, he first made, he made his first pair of spike shoes in 1895. He had his company in 1900. Unfortunately, he died in 1933, and his sons took over the business. Okay. Um, and, you know, I'm only young at that time, just enjoying life, you know, doing who, – who wants to be in business when you're in your teens? No, that wasn't for me. Um, when it's only 18, when uh, uh, both Jeff and I left the family business at the same time to do national service. Right. You know, we didn't have any choice. When I say left the business, we were, we were taken away. It was conscription, if you like. So yeah. we, and, we was, and, you know, life takes on a different sort of level then because, you know, mother's not making your meals. She's not doing the washing. She's not there to ask for this or anything you need. So you've got to start thinking for yourself. And you've got to start thinking, how can I make the best of this new world I'm in? And for me, it was the RAF. For Jeff, it was uh, the Army. Jack went to Germany, and Jeff is seeing Adidas, and he's seeing what they're doing. Um, I enjoyed my two years, certainly 12, well, probably 15 months of it. I just simply played badminton. I was, right. a, reasonable, I was a reasonable badminton player. And, and the forces, they love sport. They just love sport. If, you, if you're anything like reasonable, <clears throat> you can probably spend your know, time just playing sport so uh, I played badminton for about 15 months and uh, so that was great and yeah I could have probably stayed on there were some persuasions you know who wouldn't want to be a fighter jet pilot you know it's like oh, yeah that sounded like a good idea but didn't happen went back went back to the J.W. Foster um, family business and in its time it had been sort of the well the cream Absolute. You know, what grandfather made and his shoes, he was a genius. And what he did, and all the gold medals and everything that, uh, that they got. Um, but we went back and unfortunately, my father and uncle, they were at war with each other. They were five years difference in age and they just did not get on. Now, that's not good. There's 50-50 each in the business. And if you don't talk, you don't work together, your business goes down. And that's exactly what, when we came back, Jeff and myself, we saw the business failing. We tried to persuade them, come on, you've got to work together. No, we couldn't get them. They wouldn't talk with each other. Uh, tried to tell my father, look, why don't we do something different? Because, you know, this isn't happening. And all my father said to me is, like, no, Joe, when I'm gone and your uncle's gone, this business will be yours. You can do what you want with it. And I said, well, look, Dad, Number one, we don't want you to go. That's not the, no, that's not what we're talking about. But number two, there will be no business. It will have gone long before you go. This business will be dead. And okay, he didn't want to listen. He didn't want to hear that. So Jeff and myself, 
Fortunately, <clears throat> we got on very well and we decided that we would set up our own business. And that started as Mercury Sports Footwear, which is you're right. And it is 18 months into that when our accountant, he said, look, look, Joe, you're doing, you're doing fine. You're making money. You're, you're selling a product. It's great. You better register your name. And that was the first challenge that we had okay. because we couldn't register Mercury. Yeah. So um, I, was, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the sort of discipline that you would have picked up in the military. You said something earlier, being enthusiastic. Whatever you do in life, whether it's being a founder of Reebok, running a podcast, I'm here in a, at our private art gallery in Soho, and I think that anything you do in life, you've got to have enthusiasm. I think enthusiasm wakes you up in the morning. I think discipline gets you out of the bed and that routine will keep you doing it every single day. I think if you've got those three things together as a sandwich, you can be a success or certainly head towards success. Um, so you clearly got the enthusiasm, Joe, clearly, you know, right. but with the routine or with the discipline, how much of the military, the RAF, how much of that played into your characteristics, which went on, on to develop this very, very successful brand, Reebok? Well, I think there are two things. During the war, which was, of course, uh, 39 to 45, um, I was only four years old when it started. I was 10 when, it, when the war was over. But... Uh, you could do an awful lot, but you could uh, you could become part of the scouting organization. So both of us went into the Cubs, which was the young scouts, and then we were in scouts. So that in itself was a discipline because you learned such a lot. You, you learned how to look after yourself. Uh, you, you learned a lot of things of, of uh, we we'll say, lifestyle things, things that you must know, be able to do. And so that was our first bit of sort of learning how to value what we had, learn how to do things and be independent. So it, we're there. And the discipline in there was good. Then two years in national service, the discipline, yes, well, yeah, you have to handle that. But again, it's like all the challenges that come in life. That's another challenge. So how do you turn that around? Well, I turned it around because I played badminton and I, they saw, oh, he's okay, let's put him in the team. And, and that was good for me. So I could use that. So instead of doing what I should have been doing, I was traveling around the country, just uh, going to different events and, and playing badminton and enjoying life. So, so that was good fun. But, you know, that does come to an end because two years, you've got to decide, do you, do you accept the offer that they say, why don't you stay on in the RAF and sign on and do more? Or you go home and you go back to the, uh, um, back to the life you had. And, you know, all your friends are back there and you think, well, you have lots of friends in, in the RAF, but you know very well that they will be leaving because they're like you, they're national service. So you, you won't have those friends. It won't remain. It won't stay the way it is. Go back to where you know the people are who, yes, you, you know where all the girls are. You went to the dance halls. You, you had your friends. I played badminton again. So, you know, this was, that was a life I could go back to. Um, and it was only when we, we got back and said we saw the state of the J.W. Foster business that we started to think seriously, oh, we've got to do something about this. And we did. Good. Good stuff. Um, so you touched on about Mercury. You couldn't register it. Now, I did do a little bit of reading. And am I right in saying the whole Reebok name stemmed from this small antelope, grey antelope, in South Africa, and you kind of re-spelt it in the American version and you come up with Reebok. Am, am I, is my findings correct? Mm -hmm. Well, I've got a story about that, if you've got the time. <laughs> I've got all the time in the world for you, Joe. All the time in the world, yes. I think that's a song somewhere, but anyway. <laughs> um, we can start with the fact that our accountant has said, Joe, you've got to register your name. And we try to register the name. It's already registered. British Shoe Corporation, but they're not using it. So I go and see a patent agent, and the patent agent who's, uh, who, who will do this job for you, he, he looked it up and he found that, uh, okay, so you can't, uh, you can't have mercury, but they will sell it to you because they're not using it. And I said, okay, how much do they want for the name? A thousand pounds. That was the 
thousand pounds for the name. This is 1960. We'd just set up a whole factory for 250 pounds. We didn't have a thousand pounds to spend on the name. And he said, well, you can take them to court because they're not using it. You can claim the name and you can do that by going to court. And I said, how much is that going to cost? He said, a thousand pounds. So either way, I'm stuck. Uh, I, I can't buy it. Uh, I can't go to court. So, so he said, okay, you've got to change your name. And his window was open. It was a nice day in May. And the window was open. And he pointed to Kodak. Sign outside. And I said, well, what's, what's with Kodak? And he said, well, they made up the name. They made it up. They thought about it, made it up. So nobody can challenge them. That's their name. Oh, right. He said, but don't bring me one. Bring me 10. And I'm saying, we only want one name. Well, why 10? Well, we've got to test these on the register. And if you're going to go one at a time, it's going to take a month every time for me to send it to the registrar, the registrar to come back with some answers. Yes, no, well, you've got these, this problem. And you might be anything up to 12 months before you get yourself a new name. So bring me, bring me 10, we'll put them all in, <clears throat> and we'll get them all checked out. Well, I'm sure you sat round down the ta table and thought, what should we call this? You know, you've got it, the, the Steve Sully study, and, um, Steve Sully study. and you, know, you think, well, what, what name should I give this? And okay, so we sit down around the table. And it can get silly. When you're thinking of a name, it can really get silly. And I'm sure you've uh, probably yeah, experienced that. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, but, you know, we, we, we're in a running shoe business. How about Cougar? Cougar Sports. Does that sound good? Cougar Sports? Sure, yeah. Sounds right. <clears throat> Falcon. How about Falcon Sports? Yeah, not too bad. Good. Oh, Falcon. Falcon, that's a little bit of a nod towards the RAF. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we're thinking of this, but then let me take you back to 1943. I'm eight years old. And like COVID, this is the middle of a war. Nothing's going on. You can't go on holidays and have fun. <clears throat> yeah, you, you just stay at home. So we had stay at home events. One of those events, a 60 yard race, I was entered into this race and I won it. I had a bit of an advantage because I had J.D. B. Foster's spikes on. So maybe that helped. Maybe. Anyway, I won the race and I go up to collect my prize. And what do I get? A dictionary. A dictionary. And I'm then a dictionary. Where's the football, guys? You know, I'm eight years old. What do I want with a dictionary? <clears throat> and as it happened, because of the war, we didn't have much education anyway. Education was either done at home or some of the women who were sort of still around, they, they would um, be teaching you, but the men, men at all, they were all conscripted. Anyway, <clears throat> so I've got myself now a dictionary. A bit disgusted, but I've got a dictionary. And, uh, right, time passes. Let me take you forward back now. We're in 1960 now, <clears throat> and my dictionary is sat here on the desk next to me. Even though it's an American dictionary, it's a Webster's dictionary, and... The Americans spell a few things differently than we do. So, uh, and I'm thinking, okay, I, I like the letter R. Letter R, a nice strong letter, I thought. So I open up my American dictionary, the letter R, <clears throat> and I'm thumbing through. And it's not long before I come across R to B, B O K, Reebok. What's that? Well, it's a small South African gazelle. Wow. <clears throat> We're a running company. Gazelle. Fantastic. Top of the list. So that went to the top of the list. And, uh, okay, as you said, if I'd have had the Oxford English Dictionary, it would have been R-H-E-B-O-K. Wouldn't have looked as good. Maybe I would have passed it by, but Reebok, fantastic. So I put this top of the list and take it back to the agent. And I said, look, you've got your 10 names here. This is great. We want that one. We want Reebok. We've got to be in love with this. It's got to be our passion. So, oh, but he's a lawyer. Okay, Joe, <laughs> see what we can do. Uh, no promises, whatever. Two weeks later, he came back and he said, Joe, you've got your wish. You can have Reebok. But the registrar has a caveat on this. And then, okay, what's, what's the problem? Well, <clears throat> he's saying to us, if somebody is making shoes out of Reebok skin, you can't stop them. And 
Jeff and I, we look at each other and say, no, that's never going to happen. Yeah, that's impossible. That's, that's, that's a no starter. We're going to have Reebok. So that's how we got Reebok. However, the registrar in his wisdom said, well, because uh, of its Reebok skin and uh, somebody could make a shoe out of it, we're going to put you in part B of the register. Part A, part B. We were not concerned. We got a name. Okay. Well, 10 years later, the registrar came back and said, we've moved you to part A of the register. Okay. Well, little interest really because that's our name. But why is that? And uh, he said, well, right now, people know that Reebok is a, is a sports shoe and that the animal is very much secondary to being Reebok as a sports shoe. So we got promoted to the A, a section of the, of the register. <clears throat> so that's how we got Reebok. Well, I've got to say, uh, it's a great story there, uh, Joseph, and uh, I absolutely adore the name and I love the, the fact, you know, the, the, the animal tie to uh, your running shoe. I think it's very, very, very cool. Um, quick question. Your headquarters is in Boston, US of A, but it's founded in Bolton, England. Can you tell me a bit, bit more about why, you know, why Boston in USA and why you registered it in, in Bolton? You, you, well, the difference is one letter. <laughs> yeah. Is that what we're really referring to? One letter difference? Yeah. Well, that's just by chance, really. Just by chance. I, uh, yeah, we're doing well in the in the UK. We're we're really number one in the UK as a, as a, an athletic shoe producer. But we we were not in into soccer. We were not into football. The reason we're not in football is that by the time Jeff and I set up our business, I did us had come into the country and they'd taken on football. The, to get into football would have cost us money. As I just mentioned earlier, we didn't have the money to even buy the name, never mind push ourselves in, into the football market. <clears throat> but the athletics market was very good. It was very tight. We had uh, a, a lot of ability to get into the, to the, to the runners, the athletes, um, because of advertising athletics weekly. Everybody was really part of a, a running club. So it was quite a nice, compact sort of uh, uh, set of customers that we had there. And um, we, we also had uh, the three A's at that time, which is the Amateur Athletic Association. They brought out uh, a handbook. In the handbook was the name of every secretary of every club in the country. So three, 400 clubs, I'd got the name of every secretary. I could just mail them. And we built up a nice... Uh, uh, well, a, a nice lot of agents, really. And the agent, an agent in every club we were selling, we're doing very well. But it's a small business. You know, we, if you, you can get to a certain size, we want to grow bigger. I, I knew we could grow bigger if we could get to America. Get into America, that's another challenge. Uh, and I, I suggested this to the guys, and uh, they were all saying, it's too expensive. We don't have the money for you to go tour in America. Um, okay, fine. But I'm reading a magazine, Eurosport, and in the magazine, the government, they were, they were advertising, we want you to export. Oh, very good. And they were saying, and they, they particularly wanted us to uh, export to America. And they were willing to uh, pay for a stand um, and the return airfare and half of my expenses to go to the NSGA show, that's the National Sporting Goods of America, in Chicago. So NSGA show, Chicago, February. <clears throat> well, if you've, if you've toured in the winter in, uh, in America, you'll know that Chicago is extremely cold. Yes. <laughs> extremely cold. I, I add that to experience. But uh, so, okay, this, this is going on in February, and nobody in the family had a problem with that. They're paying for the stand, they're paying for the airfare, they're paying for half of the hotel bills and whatever. Fine, you can go. So I went in 1968 with a friend. Um, he was in the outdoor business, Bob Brigham. Brigham has a lot of shops, at least Brigham shops. Uh, store. They're in the, um, we say, the climbing, skiing areas. They have them in Manchester and London. But uh, anyway, Bob at that time said, yeah, we'll come along. I was making a boot for him, a climbing boot, a rock climbing boot. So 
we went off and we, uh, we took, actually, I, I don't know why we did it, but we took a two-week ticket because it was cheaper than just going in and out. Um, so we could spend some time. So we went to New York and uh, Bob, he, he, he looked at all the outdoor stores and I went into the sports stores just to get a feel for what this was like. Um, American market was like, this is 1968. And then we go on to Chicago. And yes, I have my shoes on the stand in Chicago. And I got a lot of interest, a lot of interest. <clears throat> and uh, the guy is saying, okay, where, where, where do I buy your product? And I'm saying England. England. And he's saying, is that New England? No, not New England, across the water, you know, England. Oh, near London. Near London, yes. <laughs> hey, yes. Yeah. I realized at that point, I, I need a distributor. I need somebody in America who will buy the product and, uh, and be our distributor. It's a big market. Uh, it really is. Uh, 350 million Americans compared to 16 million Brits. And their disposable income was so much more than ours. And uh, I, I knew about it because even Foster's in their time had been selling to uh, Yale University. Um, the guy there called Bo uh, Frank Ryan, another one, Bob G and Jack, and they were head coaches at Yale. And they were, they were taking 200 pairs a month from Foster's of hand-sewn shoes. Uh, that had ceased, but I knew that the market over there is every university, every college has coach. And coaches are king over there, the gods, coaches. And you can, uh, you can get a scholarship for sport. So you get a sports scholarship. So I knew this was a big market, that just the uh, education market, the universities and colleges. So in 1968, I'm making this trip and I realized that I need a distributor. And I knew Frank Ryan, but he was getting older then. And yeah, he was happy enough to say, yeah, well, it would be great, but you know, yeah, see if you can find somebody else. Okay. Now, when did I get into America? 1979. 68 to 79. It's 11 years of traveling backwards and forwards every year, going to the same NSGA show. And I picked up six different possible distributors, and I failed on six attempts. Absolutely failed. It didn't happen. We were trying, trying hard. Either, either they didn't have the funds, they didn't have the connections, or people over there. Same, when I tried to sell in the early days by going around in my car to the retailers, and I'm bringing my bag out, and they're saying, who are you? Uh, I'm Reebok. And they're saying, who's Reebok? Same question. Who's Reebok? Nobody knows you. When nobody knows you, it's tough. You, you, you're pushing everything up. You're trying to push that big stone up the hill and it it keeps rolling back on you and that was my problem <sighs> so what happens now we have some luck what's the luck well the luck is that right in the late 60s and all the way through the 70s running became probably the biggest category in america 350 americans by 1975 and 76 10 percent were running they had wanted a pair of shoes, 35 million, one pair of shoes, and they're out there. And uh, the thing that created this, or helped create it, was Runner's World. Runner's World was a magazine. At the end of the 60s, it was a single page, A4, telling people where the next races were, who had won the races. By 1975, it was a 50-page color magazine that everybody was buying. Fantastic. Ah, Bob Anderson and published that. And Bob Anderson, because he was doing so well in his wisdom, he decided he could tell everybody which was the number one shoe. Okay. Well, as Runner's World had grown, so had Nike. Nike from Oregon, Phil Knight, out of his garage to begin with, but with the growth of running, he was growing very fast. So the number one shoe, Nike. Okay. We could understand that. But Phil Knight had to buy these out of uh, Asia and Japan. And all of a sudden, you've got 35 million Americans, 10% probably wanted that number one shoe. Three and a half million wanted his shoe. Could he get them? No. 
he can he can up the manufacturing to the, the quantity. Twelve months later, just about started getting the things moving, and Bob Anderson said, no, 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 that, that was number one shoe last year. Now we've got another one, number one shoe. Can't remember who it was, whether it was Brooks, Sacconi, New Balance, it was one of them. Um, same thing. They couldn't get the, the volumes. So Bob Anderson, I, I think he, he was a bit under pressure to change this. So he did. And uh, he changed it to star ratings. So a five-star shoe would be the best. Now you could have four, maybe five shoes would get to be five stars. <clears throat> I knew at that point we could make a five-star shoe. You know, we're in the business. We know what we're doing. We know how we could make a five-star shoe. To become a number one, that was a gamble. We could make a five-star shoe. By 1978, we had our five-star shoe. It was part of the gold range. We made this range for the Commonwealth Games in Edmonton. And that was Aztec. That would be our trainer. That would be our volume shoe. Then we had Midas. Midas was a, a racing shoe. And we had Inca. Inca was a tax pack. Right, the gold range. So we put forward our Aztec as a, as a five-star training shoe. And uh, I go to America in... February 1979, and I have my five-star, what I think is going to be a five-star. <clears throat> but uh, along came, uh, I mean, Ronnie's growing so fast that people like Kmart, I don't know if you know Kmart, Kmart are big, big retailers, massive retailers in America. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not so familiar, but I might have, it slightly rings a bell. Yeah, Kmart came along and they wanted 25,000 pairs. <laughs> okay. Our factory, that would take them six months because our factory is not that big. 25,000 pairs. Fabulous. Okay. Uh, but I had uh, I'd a friend, a friend who was setting up the sports brand for Barta. I don't know if you know Barta. Uh, they used to be on the high street. Every high street had a Barta store. They, made, they were the biggest uh, manufacturers worldwide of footwear. They were the biggest. They still are probably one of the biggest, but they're, they're only big now in India and Latin America. Anyway, uh, and he said, look, Joe, if you get some orders, you get a five-star shoe, we, we'll help you. We'll make the shoe for you. Right, great. So that's okay. But then came out and said, but we need a better price. Oh, okay. Well, yes, Barter could make them at a better price than we could in our small factory. Uh, but uh, fortunately... I knew that this meant we, were, we had to go to Asia. We had to go to South Korea. Unfortunately, again, I'd made contact with uh, an agent for a South Korean group, and we were working together to try to produce samples of, uh, of our, what I hope would be a five-star shoe. So that's fine. I'm thinking, fantastic. And we go. And near to the end of the show, I met a guy called Paul Fireman. Now, Paul Fireman... He was running an outdoor business called Boston Camping. There's your Boston. We're in Bolton. He's in Boston. So that's the connection. And it took a long time to get to it, didn't it? But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, thank this, you for the in-depth uh, explanation and, and background <laughs> on that. Yeah. Um, so I've interviewed, so a little bit of background about me. Um, I'm... I'm in business, so naturally with my podcast, Steve Solly Study, I like to interview a lot of entrepreneurs. That's now gone into um, high-profile people right. and athletes. And the reason why athletes specifically boxing is because I box. You know, I've had 16 fights. My last fight was in March. Uh, I'm 36 and getting on a bit now for a boxer. <laughs> I want to have a few more before I um, hang up the gloves. But... I feel like there's a synergy and a mindset trait overlap between business people, athletes, and definitely boxers, you know, that fight or flight mode, et cetera. And this is the first time I've spoken to you, Joe, but I imagine a typical profile of a, an entrepreneur, you know, a founder, is very similar to a, a, an athlete's mindset. You and Jeff might, must have had it. Being alpha type males, I would, I would probably put you in that sort of category, I know 
the products, the clients, adding value, the brand is all first. I get that. I, I fully respect that. That has to be first. But is there, there must be something here as a, as a person, alpha type male. You look at Nike, you look at Adidas and, and say to yourself, I'm coming for that number one spot at whatever, whatever cost. How important was it to, to beat Adidas and to beat Nike? Well, I think uh, to try and make that sort of similarity between sport and, uh, uh, and business is that I'm sure when you're boxing, you look for that opportunity, that one, that one punch. You, you look for the mistake, the space. Yeah. We, we look for space. We look for the white space. What were they not? How can we get in here? Okay, we were competing. We were competing for five-star shoes at running. And this is great. And we were growing. Very nice that we were growing. But uh, yeah, you, you've got to also consider, you know, are you wasting energy just trying to uh, beat somebody? Or, or can we get a random? It's a bit like the problem. You know, where do you want to go with this? You want to kill the opposition? Or do you want to get to the other corner of the, the, the ring? Or you know, where do you want to be with this? And, yeah. you know, can we survive against somebody who's a heavier puncher than we are and got much more money than we have? You know, they're, they're doing these. And so you have to find your way around. And, uh, and I'm sure it's a bit like boxing. You've got, to, you've got to work out what the other guy's doing and what he's not doing. And, and, and where you can actually land your punch, where you can, you know, the soft belly, the thing that, you know, well, what? And again, another bit of luck, because we were not that big, but we were growing. And our guy down in, we had a, a tech rep down in Los Angeles. And uh, he was but an Olympian, but, uh, you know, he not quite made the team. He was a good rep, though. And his wife, his wife, in fact, was going to these aerobic classes and coming back with her friends, and they're full of it. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, we're exercising to music. I went to the next uh, class that she was going to, saw the instructor in a pair of sneakers. We think they were New Balance. Half the class were in the same sneakers. They were all women. And it came, it occurred to him, why don't we make a specific shoe for aerobics? Just for women. So we make it on a woman's last, woman's sizes, nice, soft, Glove letter. That was his idea. He's in Los Angeles. Paul Fireman, who is now my distributor, is in Boston. So he had to take the red eye overnight. Go and see Paul Fireman. Tried to sell this idea to Paul Fireman, and Paul is saying, slow down. We're a running company, and we're doing nicely. Thank you. Uh, why do we want to make shoes for girls dancing? Couldn't persuade Paul, although Paul was sort of like, you know, keep your eye on it. Let's, you know, we're not going to throw it out. But Arnold went to the back door and saw uh, Steve Liggett. Steve Liggett was our production man at that time. We're not a big company, so he could. And he persuaded uh, Steve to, to get him some samples. Short time later, he gets 200 pairs of samples of his new shoe, just plain white with Reebok on and the Union Jack. And... Uh, he gave them to all the uh, instructors. They loved them. We had a problem. We're making it out of uh, the wrong leather because this is glove leather. Glove leather, you can tear it just like a piece of paper. One millimeter thick. Oh, it's like 0.7 of a millimeter. You can imagine that's pretty thin. And, and we're trying to also rough up the, uh, the skin so that we take adhesive so you can stick the sole onto it. So probably half a million. And it was, they were breaking apart. We were very lucky because we were in Los Angeles and we were talking about women and we are talking about America. They, they just went out and bought another pair. We cured that problem and eventually more like a glove leather, more like a garment leather than a glove leather. So we, we got over the problem. But it's when, when uh, Jane Fonda, she bought her shoes to wear in her, uh, her videos, her, her fitness videos, and it just exploded. All of a sudden... We, we, were, we were a $9 million business at that point. In 12 months, we were a $30 million business. This was the size of the growth. And it was just women. We, we, I don't say we stopped being a running company, but we, we were then seen as, uh, mm -hmm. as a woman's company. Uh, Adidas, Nike, all the rest. They were male. They were sweaty. Yeah, 
No, we were this nice, beautiful little British company with this beautiful woman's aerobic shoe. And we went from 30 million to 90 million to 300 million to 900 million. So in the period of four or five years, we'd gone from almost zero to a billion. That was because we were ready to take that white space. We hit that. Adidas, both Adidas and Nike looked at it and said, no, no, that's a fad. That won't happen. It's, and it's not our market, but it became the biggest sports market around. And as I say, we went over that period up to one billion. And that was fantastic. We overtook Adidas. We overtook Nike. We became number one global sports footwear brand. Iconic. You know, like as you're talking now, 9 million, 30 million, 90 million, 700 million, you know, and then you're talking about a billion. Sorry to sort of coin this phrase or re say it, but Biggie Smalls was very, very famous saying, more money, more problems. Uh, <laughs> Joseph Foster, how true is the saying, more money, more problems? Uh, to a large extent, it's very true. But you can afford the problems then. You know, but I, I used to think, okay, when we get a big, you know, somebody's always challenging you legally with something or other, whatever it is. And I thought, when we get big, we won't. Yeah, we'll be too big for that. No, no. The challenges get bigger. And it, it's as simple as that. In fact, uh, we are talking to an American a couple of, uh, well, it was probably only last week. He's, he's in, uh, he used to work for Nike and he's also worked for Reebok. Um, and when he left, uh, he left Nike, he had a non-compete clause for 12 months of non-compete. And Reebok had, had snatched him and said, okay, we'll take you. And uh, just for the sake of it, Nike and Reebok just went to court over this non-compete clause. They were just determined, you know, at that point, there was that sort of needle between uh, Reebok and, and Nike. Uh, and I think the judge more or less uh, threw them all, out, threw them out, and said, "You know, you just you're a waste of time. <laughs> you, know, you shouldn't be doing this." I think he he likened it to uh, his wife, you know, having a pet dog. They had a pet dog, and he talking to his wife, saying, "Has your has your daddy taken you out for a walk today?" <laughs> and you know, using the dog as an excuse to, <laughs> to say you're not taking the dog out. And the, the, uh, and the judge lined, lined that to the, both Nike and Adidas, sort of, you know, beating hell out of each other, using this, this, this guy to say to each other, you know, we can have him, we can have him. So, yeah, legally, yeah, oh, yeah, you get much more, many more. But then, you know, you, you take on a lot of legal people and, and you know, and it becomes, uh, I can say, it's, it's almost part of your marketing. Yeah. yeah. All this sort of stuff does... Uh, does add more, uh, okay. well, more news, there's more things going around because they talk about things like that. So, yes, yeah, so more money, more problems, yes. <laughs> Definitely. Just on the, the subject about uh, money in Reebok and the values and stuff, just doing a bit of digging, 2005 Adidas acquired uh, either subsidiary or the actual brand for $3.8 billion dollars. And then I was reading there was a bit of a bit of kind of, I don't know, maybe, maybe, I don't know if this is the right word or right description, but a bit of struggles. And there was there was a couple of things that weren't going so right. I think that, that I read a term, it was like called muscle up, where they were trying to grow the company again. And then what I read on Forbes, uh, December 2021, so not even long ago, it was quite a buy, if I can read this right authentic uh, brand group for 2.4 billion billion dollars um so like yeah can you give me a bit more sort of context to the whole adidas involvement and then obviously what happened last year with this uh, authentic brand group well i i i'd left the company by then i'd retired out of the company when it was sold to adidas um, but it was sold to Adidas uh, purely and simply because Adidas wanted to make a bigger impression in America. Okay. They, they wanted to get a bigger footprint in America. And Reebok, had, they got the NFL, they got the NBA, they got a lot of contracts out there. And the problem with Reebok is uh, Paul Feynman. Uh, he should have done what I did and move out, let some new people come in. But 
he, he stayed too long. I think he stayed too long. And uh, you know, what he did was absolutely brilliant. You know, the, I knew the American market would make us break us, and it really made us, really made. But I think Paul Fireman should have moved over sooner because if you can imagine going from 9 million to almost a billion, zero, you know, they didn't have to sell anything. They had to, they were just chasing the business. How could they keep up with the sales? The demand was such, they didn't have to go out, push. It was, so they were not prepared. When they got to a certain level, they, they'd not prepared themselves, not built a company which, with a lot of salesmen. You know, they built people who were actually fulfilling orders. That's what they were doing. So I hadn't got that level of expertise that really now, where do we go? What's the next level? What's the next step? They've been chasing this too long, probably. So Reebok had plateaued. And at that point, <clears throat> Adidas came along with a lot of money and it was accepted. And of course, Adidas grew their company. I mean, Adidas, uh, well, they're now between 15 and 20 billion now, Adidas. Nike are over 20 billion. So those two companies have really grown. Um, Adidas, of course, uh, Reebok, although they sort of looked at Reebok as a fitness company and more of a female, women, they still overlapped. They overlapped too much because by that time, Reebok were into uh, basketball. They were into American football. You know, they got Shaquille O'Neal, Iverson, a lot of big names in these other sports. So <clears throat> Adidas more or less took all the good things. And so Reebok wasn't exposed enough. So Reebok went down. I think the revenue went down to about 1.5 billion. So if you consider when Adidas decided to sell, the revenue was only 1.5 billion. And I, and I think it was valued at even less than 1 billion. But ABG came along and bought it for 2.5 or 2.4 billion, which everybody said that's far too much money. But ABG, authentic brands, they, uh, they're not real. They've got 30 different brands that they, they run. And, but what they do have, which would be really great for Reebok over the next couple of years, <clears throat> is that they take out licenses. They license the brand to about, I think, about eight or 10 different global retailers. So now you're going to see the brand. You're going to see it big. You're going to see a lot more of the brand. The brand has been sort of hiding behind everything for maybe 10 years. Now the brand is going to be seen and it's going to be seen globally. They anticipate taking the brand from this 1.5 billion up, up to 5 billion in 12 months. That's what they're expecting to happen. So, or 12 to 18 months, it'll grow just tremendously. But that will be sales because they're visible. Where it goes beyond that, I don't know, because they're, they're not a company that... Um, that sort of is a brand. You know, if you're a brand, you, you're with the brand. They're more or less using the name. So hopefully we'll get to uh, meet them because uh, uh, Julie and I, we're, we're due to go to America for, at the end of August, we're going for eight weeks. But next year, we're going for 10 months on a speaking tour with the book. Incredible. So I, I hope <clears throat> that we'll meet up with ABG. And uh, an important part of ABG is Shaquille O'Neal. Shaq O'Neal, who was our number one basketball player, um, he, he owns 15% of ABG. And it, in fact, he, the, uh, the owner, CEO, is a guy called Jamie Salter. And uh, Jamie Salter, the, the new, when you read about him, he was saying, Shaq O'Neal, every time Shaq came in, the first thing he talked about was Reebok. Why don't we buy Reebok? And he said, and the last thing, he said when we were going and leaving is, why don't we buy Reebok? So all he could talk about was getting Reebok. Well, now they've got Reebok. So it's going to be interesting just uh, how much Shaq and Neil will, uh, will become involved. And, uh, but, but it will grow again. It will grow. How big? That's yet to be known. You, so you, you, like uh, Shaq O'Neal, incredible superstar, very high profile individual from, uh, from, from the basketball uh, background, uh, someone that I admire, adore, and, and I follow on social media. When I think about Reebok, being a boxer, I think mm -hmm. Floyd Mayweather, because he used to always wear your Reebok uh, mm -hmm. boots. Uh, Amir Khan, he was also wearing them for a very long time. 
And then when I think of other athletes, I'm thinking about like Conor McGregor because you know he yeah. was obviously you know yeah and, he was big one yeah and there's yeah. so many other athletes in different in different sectors. I mean, part of what you've done here, building this great brand, and it's more like a lifestyle brand now. I mean, you don't have to be an athlete; you could be in different di- different kind of uh, different working environments or different things, and you can still wear Reebok, and it's a very very cool thing to wear. The amount of people that you must have met and high-profile athletes and individuals. I mean, who are some of the most high-profile people that you've ever met? And how did, how did it make you feel when you sit, you're, you're, you're watching them wearing your brand, not just because they're wearing it for the sake of it, they're wearing it with pride, Joseph? Well, I, I think you've got to look at the sort of size of a company and the amount of people involved in that company. Because once I'd got Paul Fireman going, <clears throat> that was great. I turned around and I, and I went to global. I started to put on a, another 30 distributors globally. That was because America, you know, when, when you're in America, let the Americans do what they're best at. And the Americans were good at doing this. So they were taking on the athletes. I mean, you know, we used to take on uh, in, in the UK. Uh, Ron Hill was our biggest one in the UK, I think. And, uh, you know, he's a leading marathon runner. And we had more or less all the marathon runners in the UK. But again, I'm, I'm looking into distribution and I can't be everywhere. The, uh, I should think when, when we're talking about profiles, let's talk about Sean Connery. Let's talk about um, um, Roger Moore, Sean Connery. And uh, I have a list here, in fact, I've got... John Forsyth, Linda Evans, Joan Collins, Frank Sinatra, Sean Connery, Roger Moore, Jane Seymour, um, Chuck Norris. Uh, um, Chuck Norris, yeah. yeah. Chuck He's Norris, great. yeah, yeah. I've got my photograph and talking with Chuck, Chuck Norris. So you know, a lot of these things, are Robert De Niro, Michael Caine, uh, Charlton Heston, Veronica Hamill, Dolph Lundgren, Lundgren that's He-Man, uh, Robert Wagner and Jill St. John. These are just a few of the people that I was meeting when we were doing the pro celebrity tennis. And, you know, it was great. That was in Monte Carlo. We were doing this in Monte Carlo. So I, I was even invited to the palace in Monte Carlo and met with uh, Prince Rainier. So, in fact, I shared a glass of wine, had some wine. Uh, it, was this, it was this champagne we had. So in, in terms of high-profile people, I met a lot of A-listers from Hollywood more than I met athletes. That, you know, that was my role. That's where I, I met a lot of athletes, a lot of tennis players, fat, like Seguso. But, you know, it's in those days, you, you got to go back 30 years now <laughs> to when I, when I was doing this. And uh, uh, Chang, yeah, Michael Chang, he was, uh, he won the Paris uh, Open. So, you know, you, you meet a lot of people. But uh, again, you know, to me, this was a great place to be, but you get to that point where you say, well, this is not real. <laughs> I need to get back to real life because you know, this is wherever it is once I get out. So I, that was a time when I decided at the end of 1989, I will retire. And, uh, okay, I, I met a lot of these people after that time, but, uh, you know, the main thing is that my part in Reebok was uh, as a founder, which I still am a founder, uh, I was doing, I was just building up the uh, distribution. So America had got to about two and a half billion and the international group that I was organizing then, we got to over a billion in revenue. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was great. You know, you meet a lot of great people. But the, uh, the energy came from the American market. That was yeah. really good for us. Um, bit of a, uh, a question that you've probably been asked a, a few times. C- certainly, I think Rob Moore actually asked you this question, but uh, I want to get my own version of it. So speaking to, I had Charlie Mullins, right, on my podcast not even long ago. Pimlico Plumbers sold last year, came out of that business for about $150 million, and obviously it's a huge amount of money. But the question I want to ask you, Robert, like coming out of Reebok, and seeing Reebok still, you know, go through its troubles and then successes and then, you know, different athletes wearing it and then there might be a bit of kickback, etc. 
Was it a good feeling stepping out of Reebok? I mean, when you even even if the amount of money that you got from it and the success and the praise, etc., was it a good day in your life or was it a bad day? Well, I say what what had happened is that the, I became more of an ambassador. I'm I'm just travelling around the world. I'm going being picked up by a limousine at wherever I travel to, and I'm going to the best hotels and dining at the best uh, restaurants. Um, but really at that time, and say, I'd become corporate and uh, the challenge had gone. So it was good, actually, to just stand back and watch the brand. And, and it was nice to retire, not to uh, be doing whatever, but, you know, <clears throat> the energy was with the younger, younger people in the brand. They had to have the energy to build and keep on running with the brand. So for me, it was, it was good to get out. And for, for many years, I was traveling... You know, I was going to the big sales meetings, just turning up. And that was good, you know, because you, you turn up there and uh, you've not got anything to do except talk to people and say hi and how things are going on. And you know, so that's great. You know, it's, uh, it, it wasn't a big problem for me. The biggest problem for me was that uh, I think at that time I was going around the world about three times a year. So I was flying about three times a year. And... On retiring, it was like, okay, I'd be glad not to be at 35,000 feet. This would be great, fantastic. And then after being sort of uh, sitting back for a month, it's a bit like I'm, I'm having a drug. I'm thinking, where's the next ticket? Why, why am I not flying somewhere? Why are we not? And I had to get over that. <laughs> I had to get over the fact that I should be flying, I should be moving about, which I, I probably did. But right now, I'm probably doing as much flying now as I did <laughs> when I was... Uh, with the founder and building building the brand at the end of building the brand and like i say we're going to america next year we're going to america in two, just over two weeks time and we're talking about the book so now the book is exciting because the, i've got this challenge again <clears throat> that's a nice challenge to okay let's, let's get the sales up let's uh, let's talk to people yeah I know a shoemaker is already a success and he's going to be even 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 bigger, especially with all your speaking engagements and stuff. Um, someone once told me, if you want to look at a, a brand and kind of work out how they've evolved and how they've grown and how they've morphed, actually look at their logo and look at how many times it's changed. And I was doing a bit of research into that. Since 2000, sorry, since, your, since it was founded back in 1958, the brand of Reebok, Mm -hmm. actually changed nine times according to the internet or one okay. of the sources. Um, why has it changed so many times and why was that important? Well, I, I don't know what they're referring to with the changes, but I think, I mean, these days uh, everybody talks about pivoting, about doing this. Uh, if you see an opportunity, you should be willing to uh, look at it and, and go that way. And, and, I, and I think that... Uh, if you're not willing to change, if you're not willing to pivot and do different things, then your brand will suffer because, you know, you get stuck in one alleyway. You've got to be able to move in different ways and be willing to move. So um, it would be nice to sort of take the uh, description of each one of the changes that they're referring to. Uh, we, uh, we know uh, we know about uh, Adidas and we know about ABG. Those are sort of uh, changes of ownership. Um probably change also with Stephen Rubin. He was the one that gave us the, the, the money. To, right. you know, he supplied the cash to, to allow the company to grow. So, you know, yeah, I, I think a brand does change. I think it has to change in order to keep going. You know, I would, I would hate to think that uh, the brand just died with, with me, start to finish, and the brand goes. No, the brand, you know, building, building a brand is building a team. And that team have got to have, they have to have ownership. They have to feel that they're valued. And you know, when, we, when we were growing, it was absolutely fantastic. It was, you know, the culture was that of a winning company. You know, we're, we had that winning culture. And, and that attracts people. And, yeah. and this is how it grows. And it, you know, it changes. Uh, aerobics definitely changed the, the pathway and the, uh, the size of the brand. And, you know, it, these things go on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if, if your brand isn't that interesting, I, I guess there's done enough people to change it. But it's an interesting brand. A lot of people love it. There's a lot of history to it now. And, uh, I mean, we go back to 1895. So in marketing, 
marketing today is telling stories. And Reebok has a lot of stories. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, what's the worst business decision you've ever made? <clears throat> well, people ask me about that. And, you know, it's like they also say, what do you regret? Um, well, uh, you know, we became number one. So I could have made different decisions, but we became number one. You know, so it's like difficult to say that those are the worst decisions you've ever made. You know, you make a decision and, okay, if something fails, totally, immediately. And, and so I must have made a lot of bad decisions. I must have. You know, and the, but you can't you can't regret whatever you did. And they say, hey, when you become number one, what's to regret? You know, what are the bad decisions? I mean, it may have been I, I can go back to the early days when we were growing nicely, and I just a friend of mine they said, why don't you let us uh, be your distributor in the UK? And and I agreed, and they became my distributor, and it nearly took us out of business. Right. Because they went out of business and nearly took right. us with them. Right. Uh, and that, that was just another challenge, though. But when I go back to that, and you know, it was not a bad decision, but it was the wrong decision. And so you say, well, if it's the wrong decision, it's a bad decision. Um, because time, time changes you, you, the event. And that's what happened. You know, the guy who... Uh, who I agreed with, we should uh, allow them to be a distributor. He left the company. It's wow. the same guy that went to Barter, and, and he went to Barter and helped us at Barter. So, <clears throat> yeah, I would say that was probably uh, the worst decision that, yeah. uh, that, I, that I made, only because of the events that happened after I'd done that. Yeah. Um, what, I'm going to ask you something that um, I know you left the business by the time... I imagine anyway, the full force of social media kicked in because I am 36 and I knew life before social media. Yeah. Part mm -hmm. of the reason, part of my mission behind the podcast here, Joseph, is when I was in school, I was a total flop. I mean, I really was. I was an embarrassment. I mean, I couldn't string a sentence together. Terrible at reading, writing, still not great today. And there was no such thing as podcasts or interviews online. True. And I think had there been, I think it would have given me a bit of direction in my life. Thankfully, I nearly joined the Marines. So this is why I was quite interested about your national service. And my mum and dad convinced me not to do it because they were so sure I was going to get killed or something <laughs> crazy was going to happen. Right. And I believe if you don't have your own plan, you fall by default into somebody else's plan. And I became the plan of my mum and dad. They convinced me to... Uh, become a, a tradesperson. I was a, a plumber. And from the moment I started it to the moment I finished it, I absolutely hated it. Okay. Right. Um, and then I found sales. And when I got into sales, it was almost like my calling because I believe that no matter your background, your race, your gender, you know, the age, if you can sell, that's just number one. You know, any, any big corporation, any brand, any company wants good salespeople because without sales, nothing grows. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. So, so anyway, for, from that moment on, I, I went on. So I got, coming back to the point of my podcast, I like to interview people like self go getters, entrepreneurs, high profile people, successful people, because I want to influence the young minds of a young female, young male and say, I listened to our podcast, the Stephen Sully study with the founder of, of Reebok. And it's inspired me to go off and, do this mission, do this company, do this brand. That is my sole purpose behind the podcast, okay? Right. Now, with yourself being, sorry to say it again, but 87 years of age, you know, getting closer to, to 90, um, you know, you knew life before social media, Joe, Absolutely. okay? What part does social media play for Reebok? And I'm just going to refer to something here, which had you had no part to play in because this was recently – so on March the 21st, 2022, this year, I'll read it well for a Reebok suspends all branded stores and e-commerce operations in Russia after Russia invaded Ukraine. And you're probably wondering, why the hell am I asking this question? Well, it's almost like social media can be a blessing and a hindrance. It's a blessing because you can meet, you can reach so many people. You can get your message across. 
You can storytell, as you just said, in your marketing and advertisement, etc. But at the same time, if you say one thing wrong, people in social media are going to pick it up and they're going to ruin you. And like, you know, obviously the thing happening with Russia, Ukraine is it's devastating. I don't really know the, too much about it because I don't really get too much involved with politics and stuff like that. But it's almost like a very political yeah. move with social media today, you yeah. know. Um, what's your view on social media? What pl- part did it play with with Reebok? And um, what is your view with this whole kind of stepping away from Russia? I know it's not your decision, but what's your what's your view on that? Well, I think my view on that is, uh, and this is it, it's political, obviously. I mean, who you know, we it, it's it's stunning to think that in this uh, in in, in 2022 that somebody would look uh, back and do something that uh, happened 100 years ago. You know, I mean, and, and this has happened. You know, we have a war now. And, and it is something, yes, politically, they have to work it out. And, uh, and, I, and I think now it's, everybody's got to be seen to be doing the right thing. And doing the right thing at this moment is, is just saying, look, you know, that's a bad thing in this day and age. We, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. So we can't, we can't support what you're doing. So we can't do business with you. You know, these are sort of, this is the way that business is now. I mean, you know, in the same way, you know, you've got to be, you, you, you've got to be look at everything politically with political correctness. It's, um, it. It, can, I, can I just interject? I mean, it's a very, very, because I've got a very small brand here in comparison mm-hmm. to Reebok or any of these great giants. But obviously, as, as we grow, um, we're starting to find this, this kind of, potholes that you can fall into and you can damage yourself yeah and you know i'm going to raise certain things that happened in the last few years i mean you obviously got this this whole russia invading ukraine you've got things like black black lives matter you've got things like transgender you've got all these kind of things that maybe when you first started back in the you know back back in the day these are things that you didn't really have to consider too much because that number one, they probably weren't spoken about. And, and number two, you didn't have a platform on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, et cetera, where you say one thing, someone can overemphasize that or change the narrative or kind of misconstrue what you actually said or your view. And it can really mess things up. And I believe every time there's an action, there's some kind of reaction and you're hoping that reaction is a positive one. But, you know, if you stand for one thing, that might uh, excite and energize a group of people, but on the other side of the stuff, it can really piss off a lot of people. So, how do you deal with that paradox? Well, I don't. Julie does. <laughs> Julie looks after all our, all our social media, but uh, I mean, I agree. You, you've got, you know, you, you've got to tell tell positive stories. You, you've and you've got to be politically correct. And, you know, your business has to go in that direction. Uh, that, uh, you know, diversity, whatever it is, whether it's uh, colour, you know, whether it is, whatever it is, it's, it's to stay away from being controversial. You, you make a controversial statement and uh, half the people will love it, half the people will hate it, but the, the ones who hate it seem to be the ones who make most noise. <laughs> and, yeah. and they make such a lot of noise that uh, uh, I think uh, Gary Lineker had to uh, had to apologise only after the uh, after the girls had won the the European Cup because he said you know these are the best bra on and you know everybody took that as being sexist and he, he just meant it as being flippant and whatever but you know that's what that's what social media does for you you know people will pick it up and pick out of it. Uh, if, if they want a bit of a fight, and I think some of these people do, some people, it's almost a profession sometimes now, social media, that, you know, what, what can we find that's good, what can we find that's bad? But as I say, that uh, <clears throat> good news is no news. And if good news is no news, it means that the only news there is is bad news. So, you know, people, well, you can see it on television. You know, every, everything that comes out, so much of it is just, what is bad? You know, always bad today, and so you, politically, I've never been that uh, sort of involved. I try to keep away <clears throat> because it, it is a minefield. 
you, know, you, you will run into problems no matter what you say. Somebody will pick something out of it and say, ah, you know, that was pretty bad. That was whatever, you know. It's, uh, but social media is definitely important. Yeah. But nowadays, it's influencers. Um, <clears throat> you were talking about, you know, in our early day, we were a performance company. <clears throat> now we're a fashion company. I'm talking we being Reebok. <laughs> yeah. Reebok is a fashion company. Adidas and uh, Nike are fashion companies. There's a time when I heard that you could never mention the word fashion at Nike. You know, come on, we're a performance company. And they still consider themselves a performance company. But street is fashion. And that's where it all goes. Street it becomes fashion. And if, you, and if you get to street, you know, that's fine because you've got a big company. And... Uh, you know, Reebok did that. Reebok became big, so are your street. And, and yes, at that point, uh, and I think we did it. You know, you, you wouldn't allow anybody to make statements for the company. You know, it, it had to be worked out, go through marketing, go through the right channels, even tested leadly, leadly on many occasions, uh, just so you made the right statements. Even, you know, sometimes the statements mean nothing, but uh, you just... Somebody asks them to make a comment on it, they make sure that it's uh, the right comment. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, back in the day, you probably remember the very famous uh, speech or a few speeches that Mr. Gerald Ratner made, who had the biggest jewellery company in the world at one stage. And I think that they, they still call it today doing a Ratner. <laughs> And that yeah. could be quite uh, catastrophic. I think he lost over 500 million off his share value within like 24 hours or so. But at the same time, there's another school of thought that sometimes when you are very controversial, very outspoken, I'm just thinking about fighters here, you know, the Conor McGregor's, the Floyd Mayweather's, the yeah. Tyson Furious, et cetera. It can actually promote yourself. So, yeah, I guess it really depends on how you started. If you started as a controversial kind of person or a, or a brand, then you kind of need to maintain that. But if you're prim, proper, squeaky clean, and then suddenly you come out with something so wild, I don't think your audience is really going to understand that and they're going to, you know, shoot you down. Well, we, we get a lot of examples of that, of uh, people saying the wrong thing. And again, I, I think a lot of that is if you, uh, if you are a big company and you're very successful, you, you can sometimes think that you know the answers to everything and you make a comment. But, you know, Comments can be taken either fully, can be understood, or they just can be taken word for word. And if any one of those words uh, don't fit, and somebody can, and, you know, the bigger you are, of course, the, the bigger target you are. I mean, it's as simple as that. You know, somebody who, uh, who isn't known by anybody makes a statement, nobody's interested because you, you need, there's something to lose. And uh, so the bigger you are, you've got to be careful that you just, uh, Say the right things instead of, you know, and if you're asked to make a comment about anything, keep it uh, as sort of politically correct as you can do. You know, like we, when I we, asked you uh, your net worth. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. Joe, I've only got three more questions to ask you, so I wanted to tell you that because I know I've taken up a lot of your time, but it's been valuable, valuable stuff. <laughs> so let me ask you three questions, okay? okay? When I think of right. Nike, the shoe or Adidas or Jordan or Reebok. So Nike, I think Air Force One, that's like the number one that comes to my mind. When I think of Jordans, I've got a pair on right now. Uh, right. They are the Jordan ones. And then my second best Jordans are Jordan 4s. I love them. When I think of Adidas, I'm thinking probably like Stan Smith or something, or I think there was a trainer called Samba, which is back in the day. Yeah. And then when I think of Reebok, there's no other shoe but the Reebok Classic. I mean, it's it's just number one. It's it is it is a classic. It, it will never die. It's, you could wear them at a wedding. You could wear them to school. You can wear them to work. They fit every occasion, in my humble opinion. Obviously, you've got to pull it off, and you've got to have the, the, the confidence. But when you think of Reebok, what's the number one product that stands out for you that has stood the test of time, Joe? Well, I mean, you're quite right with the classic. And uh, that classic, <clears throat> I can take you back to the 1979 Aztec, which was the, uh, our five-star shoe. The classic has the same sole, the sole that I designed. That's the classic sole. 
It also has the star crest and it also has the silhouette that was on that shoe in 1979, the Aztec. Okay, Aztec was made out of nylon. The difference happened because Reebok more or less invented soft leather. You know, sports shoes were made out of fairly firm leather until we came up with the um, aerobic shoe. And the aerobic shoe was soft. <clears throat> okay, it needed some development to get it so it was strong enough to be in footwear. And so that became the classic. So the silhouette that I designed, the, the uh, sole that I designed, the star crest <clears throat> are all part of that shoe, which amazes me after so long that <clears throat> that now is an absolute standard. Like I say, it's timeless now and it sells on and on. The other one that's timeless with uh, Reebok now is the Club C. <clears throat> Club C is, uh, it stands for Club Champion, which is a tennis shoe, really. And, but it's very similar to classic. They probably, probably call it a classic as well now. So Club C and the classic that we know, uh, <clears throat> yeah, they're timeless. For, uh, for me, though, for, for Reebok, <clears throat> I think one of the best, uh, and it will be around for a long time, is the pump. Pump is, is great. I mean, there's so many good features on the pump, uh, where they want pump fury now, where they, the bladder is on the outside of the shoe, <clears throat> or you, you go to the basketball. <clears throat> Everybody remembers uh, D Brown dunking from the halfway, bending down and pumping up his shoes. You know, that sort of happened. These sort of things are just, again, timeless. So there's a lot of timeless shoes. For me, though, when it, one of the best shoes, it won't, you don't even know it now, is World 10. <clears throat> and World 10 stands for the World 10 10 mile record. Right. That, uh, uh, that Ron Hill, Hill, he broke that. He broke it a couple of times in his World 10s. So, but you know, those are sort of inner classics that for me, is, is one of the uh, iconic shoes that we made. Beautiful. Um, being nearly 90 years of age, how have you stayed so young, Joe? Um, I think it's because my mother had good skin <laughs> and they found out all, all the problems, they found, the doctors found that out, so now I have enough pills to, to keep away. I'm type 2 diabetic. Um, my, you know, my older brother, Jeff, if you read the book, I assume you have, he died when he was 46. But he died from <clears throat> stomach cancer. And that's because he tried too hard. He wanted to win every time. And he pushed himself to the point where, whether he was cycling or running, at the end of the race, he was physically sick. So unfortunately, he, he, he died of stomach cancer. My grandfather died at... Uh, 53, <clears throat> but that was, I'm sure that was to do with, with diabetes, type two. My younger brother, he died at 50, 52, 54, and that was type two diabetes. And so fortunately they found out I had type two, so I now could take a pill for that. So how do I stay so young? I say, luckily, my, my mother had very good skin and she didn't look old. So I think it's inherited. <laughs> I was, and, I, I was uh, referring from to that, your I think, energy, Joe. Well, I'm, I, I'm still fairly energetic, but, uh, you know, I've got a new hip and a new knee and a few different bits and pieces. So um, as time goes by, we're playing badminton, of course, and ease go. Eh? <clears throat> you know, these are things that happen to you. you, you so you've just got to keep, uh, you've got to keep as, as energetic as you can do. And uh, I did have COVID, which slowed me down quite a bit early on, very early on, I had COVID. <clears throat> um, I, I do wish I was fitter, personally. I, I, I can't go out running anymore, which I used to, but I can I go out and walk. Uh, <clears throat> so keeping fit, I, I think it's a matter also of attitude. I think uh, you you know if you want to keep doing things, you just keep on doing as much as you can do. And and mentally, I, I think writing the book and now going on these uh, on the speaking tour with the book is uh, is it keeps you keeps you bright, keeps you thinking, and uh, and I think that helps. Definitely, very sound advice. Last question, Joe, and I'll be out your hair. Uh -huh. So I came up with a mantra when I first started my first company when I was younger, 
And the mantra goes like this. Be happy, never content. Now, I've got my interpretation of what that means. But if I'm going to ask the founder of Reebok, Joseph William Foster, give me a rendition of what be happy, never content means to you. Well, I think <clears throat> be happy. I think being happy is something you have to have in your in your life. You've got to be with the right people. You've got to be able to communicate well, you know, and you've got to uh, have people around you who sort of feel the same feelings. So it's surrounding yourself with like-minded people, people with energy, people who want to have fun. So that's what never content is that you have to keep on moving to different things. You have to keep on trying new ideas out. Uh, if, if you're content, that's when you stagnate. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I can agree with you, but uh, people ask, you know, what are the three most important things uh, when you run in a business? Uh, and I say, well, first, number one, fun. You're going to have fun. Number two, <clears throat> you're going to have more fun. And number three, your life must be full of fun. Because if you're not, you're not going to, the rest of it, you either learn, you pick up, you experience, <clears throat> but if you're not having fun, you won't be successful. That's it. So to me, it is, yes, <clears throat> enjoy your life. And uh, but like I say, never be content. Keep pushing. There's always something else. There's always something new. I know uh, my first wife used to, to say to me, you always want to make something global. <laughs> Whatever I was doing, I started. Why, why do you always want to make it global? Well, you know, that's that's the way to <clears throat> that's the way to see that you you succeeded. It's the measure. It's keep keep trying. You know, keep saying, well, where do we take this? How do we how do we do this? Right now, we want we want Shoemaker to be an absolute bestseller in America. That's the big market, and that. So we won't be content until that happens, and then we will be content. I don't know. What's the next one? <laughs> Shoemaker Part Two. Watch Shoemaker out. Part Two. Or Shoemaker you? the movie. <laughs> Oh, <clears throat> we have a couple of people who are interested in doing that. Lovely. Okay, yeah. watch this space. Joe, um, Joseph, it's been an absolute honour. I mean, listen, did I ever think I would ever speak to the founder of Reebok? Not my wildest dreams. And thankfully, because I've got this platform now, I've connected with you and I've learned a lot. It's been an honour. I think it's been a great episode. I think a lot of people are going to get inspiration and education and motivation from this particular talk. And yeah, I'm just so thankful. So thank you very much, um, Joseph. And um, I want you to have a fantastic trip and all the success with Shoemaker, the book. Stephen, thank you very much. And it's been a privilege for me to talk to you because you've got the energy. You've got that desire to move forward all the time, you know, sideways on occasions, but move forward. You keep moving forward, you get to a different level. And that, those levels, step by step, you learn a lot more and you appreciate a lot more that goes on and yeah thank you very much it's been uh, interesting 